All right. Okay, thank you everyone for coming to our uh, Ag Buyer Data monthly webinar today. I'm Monica Polshow. In case you haven't met me yet, um, I should mention again, if you joined and haven't muted yet, please go ahead and mute yourself and uh, unmute later on when we when we um, are finished with the webinar and you have questions or feel free to write them in, in, the, in the chat. Um, and Anarita, we might need to mute somebody there. <laughs> um, Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Selby, our speaker for today's meeting. Um, Peter has a, a really strong background in software engineering. So he has a bachelor's in software engineering from Clarkson University. And after that, he gained uh, five years of industry experience uh, working in industry software development for a private company. Uh, since then, he has moved on to uh, Cornell University, uh, where he's in Kelly Robbins Lab. And he's been uh, working on the BRAPI project, which he's going to talk to us today about. Um, he has now about five and a half years of experience as the, the breeding API uh, project coordinator. So we're really pleased to, to have uh, Peter uh, talk to us about BRAPI because uh, we think it's a really interesting project that can demonstrate some synergies between the databases that we have here at Ag by Data and ways to, to promote collaboration. Um, he's also part of the, has been a member of the Data Federation and Data Federation Training Working Groups. He's currently the chair of the Data Federation Training Working Group and has a uh, one of those qu qualities that allow you to understand both the software and the communications aspect and effectively communicating software to, to, to everyone. So Peter, uh, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Monica and, and Rita. Um, yeah, so uh, for those who I haven't met yet, hi, um, I'm Peter Selby. Um, and um, yeah, I work on the, the BRAPI project. Um, I am uh, technically a, a team of one working on the BRAPI project, um, but uh, we've uh, been able to build a, this wide wide community that's continuously growing so um i am i am a team of one but not alone um so yeah today i'll be talking about uh rappy um some of the applications and impacts of the project um and uh we'll we'll get started with uh for those who are not familiar um, just what is the breeding API, uh, also known as as Brappy? Um, so, as a, as a sort of formal definition, um, Brappy is a standardized RESTful web service API specification for communicating plant breeding data. Um, we'll dive into sort of each one of those terms a little bit and break it break it down in case you're not familiar. Um, starting with the uh, API. So uh, API is an acronym for Application Programming Interface. And so just like uh, you would have a user interface where um, a user interacts with a, a computer or piece of software um, to issue commands or, or uh, send or receive data, Application Programming Interface is exactly the same thing. It's just from uh, one piece of software to another. Um, so there's a there's a variety of different types of uh, APIs, different flavors depending on what you're what you're working on, what you're building. Um, uh, but yeah, so it, an API is just way from for one piece of software to interact with another and control or submit data to another piece of software. Um, so specifically, the the flavor that we're looking at here for, um, uh, for for the flavor of web service we're looking at for Brappy is a web service, uh, and so yeah, a web a web service um, is pretty straightforward. It's a service that is provided over some network over the over the web. Um, and so the the important thing here is the this this loop. Uh, of re sort of request response loop that's pretty much always present in in any type of um, uh, web service API where um, one uh, tool uh, client whatever um, will construct a request and send that request over some network to the service provider 
um, the service provider will do something with that, uh, produce an output and send the response back. Um, and you know this this could be a, a number of different ways. So in this case, we're just doing some uh, calculation, um, sending a request, getting the answers response. You could be submitting some data, um, in which case the response might just be, "Yep, I got that data," or you might be requesting some data, saying, "You know, give give me the information on on this uh, uh, this particular crop," and the response will be, "Here's here's all the data you asked for." But that 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 loop is is always important. That there's uh, this loop going over the network for for a web service. Um, and more specifically, um, digging down a little deeper, um, we're talking about RESTful web services. REST stands for representational state transfer. Um, that's not so important. I have to look that up every time I I need to remember it. Um, but yeah, rest restful web services are a, a flavor of web service. It's a type of architectural design um, that uh, take advantage of um, the the HTTP standards that we already know and use every day um, as part of sort of normal web browsing. Um, that that everyone uses. So um, requests are as simple as uh, making a making a URL. Um, and instead of uh, receiving a web page back or some HTML or whatever, um, the the response to the 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 URL is going to be some data. Um, usually, when we're talking about REST, we're talking about data uh, represented as JSON. You don't have to use JSON. It's just what's typically used. Um, but for the for for Brappy, we uh, all the responses are um, formatted in in uh, JSON. Um, and finally, the the last two here to to break down the definition. Brappy is a standardized specification, um, and this this is a point I really try to. Uh, make clear to everyone because there's a lot there's there's often some uh, misconceptions here um so uh first of all brappy is a is a standard so it has a standardized set of uh data models um and uh um, methods for for interacting with those data models um and sort of describes the full set of uh, excuse me which which data um you can interact with and how to how to interact with it. Um, and finally, at its core, Brappy is just a technical specification that defines that standard. Um, so uh, there's there's often some misconceptions at this point. You know, the I, I people have asked me, you know, where where is the software package that I can just hand you and and then you have Brappy, or you know, where is the server that runs Brappy? And that that uh, isn't really a thing. At its core, Brappy is just a set of technical documents, you know, a technical specification that define this standard, and it's up to um, the the software developers and um, database managers and in all the different groups to implement the standard. Uh, in their own system, um, so uh, that's that's sort of the core. As as part of the community and and part of the project, we want to make that as easy as possible. So there are libraries and and auto generated code and and things uh, to make that process easier. But at its core, it's important to remember that the Brappy project is just that technical specification. Okay, and. Here is everything that Brappy covers at, at sort of a high level. Um, uh, we break the Brappy specification into these four modules, the core, germplasm, genotyping, and phenotyping. That's purely for convenience and ease of being able to find things. Um, in in previous iterations of the standard, uh, the document you know the, there was a single document that described the whole spec, and it was getting much too large to find anything, so we broke it into these sections just to 
to organize things a little bit easier. Technically speaking, they, you know, everything is interconnected as you can see from, from this map. Um, uh, so, you know, there's, there's uh, all, all the pieces work seamlessly together, um, whether or not they're in the same module. Um, yeah, and I, I won't go through all of these, but um, basically these, these are uh, data models that represent concepts, um, uh, that represent data or metadata um, that the, the BRAPI community has uh, described as important uh, for um, breeding purposes. And, um, you know, this, this is a somewhat of an active standard still. So um, if there's something here that's not covered or, or something that uh, you have a use case for that um, uh, Brappy doesn't cover, um, there are ways of, of uh, submitting that to the, to the community, submitting it to me, and we can wrap it into the, the next version of the standard to make sure that the standard stays current and, and um, keeps up with what everyone's working on. Um, okay, so yeah, we'll just take a quick look at sort of a typical request response loop um, when when using Brappy just to get an idea of how this might work. Um, so on the left hand side here, we have a, a client application. Um, this could be an R script. This could be a, a you know, a little web app, this could be a, a phone app, you know, what, whatever, whatever the client application might be. Um, it has uh, a user interface and some controller um, code. But um, at some point, the, the user interface is going to trigger some request, um, some Brappy request. And so um, there's this layer in here, the request builder is going to um, map the 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 client application whatever however it represents data it's going to map that to the brappy standard um, data data representation and then it's going to send it over the http service to the server application um, and the server application is going to have an api layer that accepts those those requests it's constantly listening for those requests um, and then again it's going to have this layer of, of object mapping where it's going to take the Brappy standard object it was sent and transform it, map it into however the the, the server application represents data, whatever whatever structures or, or style that, that may be formatted in, you've got this mapping layer. So now we've got, we've got this mapping on, on both applications. So each application can continue to work um, with its own internal data structures the way uh, that they were built, but they're communicating with each other using this Brappy standard specification. Um, and so, yeah, once once the request is fulfilled on the server side, whatever that might be, again, it'll pass back through the, the mapping layer to map it back into the, the Brappy standard um, objects, send the response back to the the client application and the client application can take that response in some kind of response handler and map it back to information that um, the client application knows how to use or present to the user, you know, whatever whatever that might be. Um, so that that's sort of a, a typical uh, request response loop for for a, um, Brappy compatible software. Um, there are other use cases and other ways of of doing this. Um, you know, these these are just the 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 tools, uh, but this is this is a pretty standard example. Okay, so yeah, this is a, uh, started to get into this a little bit, but um, why why do we need Brappy? So the name of the game here is is interoperability. We're trying to make um, systems interoperable, um, have data compatibility, have compatibility of tools. Um, 
and that's that's really the the whole goal of the project. Uh, so um, I, I put this little cartoon together to sort of represent uh, manual interoperability. So as you can see, there's, um, and I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this sort of setup where you've got one application, uh, you want to try and get data from this first application to the second application, you need to uh, export some type of Excel file, uh, you know, maybe massage the data a little bit in the center, massage the formatting, um, and then upload it into the second application. Um, this, you know, this is totally fine. I, I would consider these two systems interoperable because you can get data from one to the other, you know, it is, it is possible to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's messy. Um, especially if you have some human interaction in the middle, trying to adjust things, not everything goes perfectly. Um, and, and it can often be really slow and, and tedious to, to try and do. Um, so this, this is sort of the, the, the problem we're trying to tackle with, with Brappy is to, uh, increase interoperability in general and also enhance it to, to be uh, better. So if we restructure that same cartoon with the um, with Rappy in the mix, then the picture sort of starts to look like this. Um, and you see a lot of the user interaction has disappeared from this uh, from this cartoon. Um, so now we just have a user, in application two, who's made some request for data, and the software is going to say, ah, I don't have that data, but application one does, and send the request over to application one, going to pull it out of the database, transfer it back um, to, to either, um, you know, either just to view for, for the user, or to copy it into the database, or um, to perform some analysis on whatever whatever it may be, um, it's going to be uh, sort of automating this data transfer. As we saw with those mapping layers, you know, there would be a consistent mapping of the Brappy standard uh, data, and so it will be the same every time um, pulling data from from one. Uh, tool to the other. Now, um, this sort of setup will work with, with any API. You don't actually need Brappy specifically uh, to, to work this type of setup. Any API would give you this automated data flow, um, sort of this automated uh, interoperability. Um, one of the benefits of standardizing it is um, the ability to to build to that standard and have a common language that that everyone is communicating in. So now um, we can start swapping things out and say, well, instead of pulling data from application one, uh, maybe I want to pull it from this third application. Uh, and the because we're using this standard the standard data models, the you know the Brappy data models, um, everything's still talking the same language. This should still work, um, you know, and, and the user doesn't even necessarily need to know that the the data they're looking at is coming from a different source, um, or you might want to take it from a different type of source, some sort of data warehouse, uh, you know, being able to standardize the communication. And so all these systems are speaking the same language um, is the sort of the other part of, of Brappy and, and why it's nice to have this, this standardized data system. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to touch on the Brappy community a little bit. I, I mentioned them at the beginning of the talk. Um, so who is who's the Brappy community? Um, so Right now, um, we have uh, 37 registered uh, partner organizations. Um, uh, these are sort of advertised on, on the website, brappy.org, um, as, as partners. Um, we have somewhere around 250 different, um, uh, 250 
uh, people in the community, plant breeders, software developers, data managers, other experts in, in various fields. Um, and, you know, it's it's a little bit tough to to pin down an exact number. There's there's no registration to become part of the community. Um, I'm just sort of taking numbers from our Slack channel and our mailing list and, and uh, trying to extrapolate roughly the size of the community. Um, but we do have uh, six elected members of the advisory board um, for the project um, elected by the community. Um, and uh, there's a, there's a uh, term length and sort of a, a refresh cycle. So we'll get new people in the advisory board regularly um, to, to represent the community and uh, manage the, the long-term goals of the project um, uh, going forward. Um, and and I like to show this slide just to sh show the the global community um, is uh, uh, a lot a lot uh, of projects based out of uh, here uh, at Cornell. It's sort of sort of to be expected, but um, beyond that, there it's really a, a global scale of the the project and um, working with the different people around the world um, to try and really find a standard data model that will work for, for everyone and be able to share data and tools um, uh, around the world and, and across all these different communities. Um, yeah, speaking of, um, so one of the really um, sort of, I think, key parts to the Brappy community and, and how we've been able to uh, grow and sustain ourselves um, so well is through the hackathons. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, these these are events. Um, uh, they, they used to be about, they used to be once a year um, since the pandemic. Uh, we've actually moved to... Uh, twice a year uh, schedule, but um, yeah, these these are events um, where everyone in the community is, is invited to come together for a week um, and uh, work on BRAPI related projects. And, you know, this is a, a time for uh, collaboration um, and sharing of ideas and helping each other out. Um, and, you know, a week isn't very long, but it is enough to start a project and start a collaboration effort um, that can then continue on uh, going forward um, and sort of connecting these these different groups from around the world. Um, oh, I, I have photos. Yeah. So, um, like I said, we've had uh, hackathons. Um, you know, roughly once or twice a year uh, for the past few years. Um, uh, with the pandemic, we had to change them to virtual, so uh, you won't see. Yeah, there's a there's a big gap here. This was our most recent hackathon um, uh, in uh, in South Carolina, hosted by Clemson University. Um, we just uh, had that back in 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 March. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested in, in joining the community, attending a hackathon is a great way to um, get started with the community, meet some of the, the people who are involved and, and start collaborating and, and uh, building systems together. Um, okay, um, yeah, so looking at uh, some of the applications and impacts of the project. Um, so yeah, this is, this is actually relatively new. Um, so new on, on bradby.org, there is a page, um, presenting, um, all of the Brappy compatible software. Uh, so this is all the software, um, that people have, uh, built that is Brappy compatible, which showing on the screen is, is just a subset, um, uh, as as an example, but yeah, there's there's a web page there for um, showing off all all the software that uh, is Brappy compatible um, 
and a link there to to register new software if you've got tools or uh, systems uh, that are Brappy compatible and you want to present them to the rest of the community, that's the place to do it. Um, and uh, so I, I like I like showing this slide as some of the examples of um, use cases uh, that have have sort of been solved and and accomplished by by the community. Um, in particular, because the sort of the first round of funding that um, I was involved with uh, back in 2017, um, as, as part of that funding, there was sort of a set of goals. Um, we set a, a, some some use cases that we would like to be able to uh, achieve with Brappy, and I'm happy to say that. Um, with this list I'm about to show you, we achieved and then some all the all, all the uh, use case goals that the original project had, and um, it was a good Kickstarter to to uh, push off from there and and keep going. So, um, yeah, first off, uh, so uh, many of you may be familiar with the the KSU Fieldbook app. Um, it is now Brappy compatible, uh, um, has been for, for about a year now. Um, and so uh, collecting data um, in the field uh, is, it, you know, we're trying to get the, the data collection as, as accurate um, uh, and, and um, get it into the digital ecosystem as soon as possible. Um, so, now, uh, within the KSU Fieldbook app, you, you can download your um, traits and your pro plot layouts and, and everything you might need to go collect uh, manual phenotypes in the field. Um, that all goes into the app. You go out into the field, collect your data, and when you're ready, you can upload it back uh, through Brappy again and push all those uh, new uh, observations back up to to your your um, uh, your database, and so uh, yeah. Again, this is to, to avoid things like um, downloading the Excel file and and trying to manip manipulate things manually as you're uploading and downloading data. Um, as soon as you collect data in the field through the app, it's part of the digital ecosystem and gets maintained and tracked all the way back to the database um, where it can then be be manipulated um yeah this uh in terms of genotyping um this is one of the use cases we wanted to to tackle um uh, i don't know if this use case is necessarily used in production so much right now um, but it is it is solved. It, it was working for a little while, and then I think some of the groups involved um, moved on to other things. But uh, yeah, it is it is available, um, and this this is has to do with sample management. So basically, um, submitting samples to some genotyping lab. Um, you can submit all the metadata and everything through Brappy. Uh, make a request for. Uh, genotyping services or, or whatever other services the lab uh, offers. Um, uh, yeah, send, send all the metadata um, along with, you know, the, the, the physical samples through snail mail, um, and then make sure that all that same metadata and the samples uh, gets sent to your genotyping database as well. Um, and allowing a, a, a connection here. You notice this connection is not necessarily through Brappy. Um, getting getting the data downloaded from from the lab to the the long term storage, um, but there there are ways of facilitating that through Brappy as as well, um, depending on how you how the system set up and and organized. Um, yeah, looking at uh, different types of analysis engines. So, you know, now we've 
uh, we've collected some field observations and we've collected some genotypes um, into our, our different databases. Um, and there are a couple of tools that I know of right now that are um, uh, representative of this, this use case um, uh, currently, currently in use. And this is uh, pretty straightforward, just being able to pull the raw data um, from these different systems, you know, again, doesn't matter necessarily where they are or, or uh, you know, the the client, the the user doesn't of the uh, the user of the analysis engine doesn't even need to know the details of how how the data was retrieved. They just say, you know, we want um, the data for this study, and Brappy, you know, the Brappy standard takes care of collecting that data from the different sources. Um, and then doing some analysis and producing some report or visualization or or whatever uh, you're interested in. So those were um, uh, sort of sort of the big three from the original funding that that have now been solved, and um, sort of along with that, many many other use cases uh, to to sort of supplement and and. Um, uh, work with a, a, a lot of the things in, in that, are, that are involved in breeding. Um, this last uh, example here, um, for those who know Lucas Mueller, uh, he ran into my office one day uh, sometime around uh, 2018, 2019, and just shouted, we need braps, and then ran away again. And it was a few hours before I could track him down and figure out um, what the heck he was talking about. Uh, and so that was the the conception of this idea of braps, and these are brappy apps, or brappy applications, um, and these are uh, single uh, web page um, applications, often written in JavaScript, um, that rely entirely on brappy APIs to to control and and um, uh, um, collect their, their data and, and run. Um, and so what this means is uh, any, uh, anyone who wants to use one of these tools, as long as their system has the appropriate um, Rappi APIs set up, these tools will just work sort of plug and play, um, you know, drop, drop it into the website, add a single tag of JavaScript to, to your website, whatever, and you get this whole tool and set of functionality um, for, for free. Um, so that was the idea. And um, after that, we uh, started building out uh, BRAPs. We now have a, a library of BRAPs. Again, on, on brappy.org, the, there's a library of BRAPs available. Um, and uh, people are building more as we speak. There's sort of a continual effort to make uh, little tools and visualizations and things that are uh, entirely run on Brappy and, and can be shared. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a, a good um, uh, representation of not only sharing data, but also so sharing resources and sharing tools. Um, this is, uh, you know, sort of one of the principles of of big data and uh, something that uh, people have been talking about um, a lot. Uh, leave leave the data where it is. You know, don't need to transfer huge amounts of data if you can bring the tool to the data. Um, and so that that was sort of one of the guiding concepts around BRAPS is being able to bring the tools closer to where the data lives. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So just a lot, sort of, uh, last slide here. Um, there's a lot of resources available, uh, on brappy.org. Um, uh, if you're, if you're interested in more information, um, I will give a, a call out to the, the GitHub as well. Um, if you are using brappy and, and have, um, any issues or anything arise from, uh, uh, using using Brappy or trying to figure it out, uh, the GitHub is a great place to submit those issues, and we can get them fixed for um, the next version of the specification. Um, 
And uh, yeah, down at the bottom here, the the contact page on Brappy um, can send messages to me um, or join the Brappy mailing list or join the Brappy Slack uh, um, uh, Slack workspace. Um, yeah, and so I think that's that's about it. Um, if there are any questions or anything, I can take those now. Um, and yeah, here's my uh, my email if you have any follow up questions after the after the webinar. All right, thank you, Peter. Very nice talk. Um, I learned some things. We can open things up for questions. Um, so feel free to either type a question in the chat or unmute yourself, raise your hand um, and go ahead and ask questions. And I can go ahead and, and start us off with a question. So one of the things that um, I've always been impressed with about Brappy is how, how well it's adopted across the community. I mean, you showed the slides with uh, the international uh, rate, uh, adoption rate or essentially how many organizations internationally use the, the Brappy specification and standard. Um, so uh, how, how do you do it? Can you speculate on uh, wh what uh, what may have driven the success of adoption? Because it seems like we've learned that uh, if, if you're already an established uh, program, there can be some inertia to, to change the software and behavior of your organization just to something new. And it looked like on that list that you show that there were a couple of organizations that were participating that were already well-established prior to Brappy began. So um, can you speculate on, on what uh, what parts of the Brappy program might've led to that sort of adoption success? Uh, I can speculate. Um, it's tough to know for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I think, um, well, part part of it is just a sort of patience and and growth. The the fact that um, sort of the more people who use the Brappy spec, that the stronger the community gets, um, and so it it sort of has a compounding uh, effect uh, on the on the growth. Um, just the more people who are using the spec, then there are more resources within the community to to pull from. Um, I think that's part of it. Uh, um, another piece uh, I think is really sort of my my uh, mentality on it is I I tell people I'm I'm a software engineer first, um, and uh, I, I you know so I want to solve the the technical problems first. You know I I. I I, I I always tell people, you know, if if the Brappy specification is standing in your way from solving some issue, just solve it, and we'll have the standard catch up. Um, you know, the, that's that's a big piece of it is trying to to listen to the community and work with the developers and and uh, folks within the community to just solve the problems they're facing um, first, and then have the standard catch up and and sort of match what we figured out on on how to solve these different issues. Um, so I think I think that's probably a, a piece of it. Um, uh, I I think sort of the last piece is this was sort of a very uh, niche idea. you know I I don't know of any other uh, really big players sort of in this space of of um, uh, standardized uh, phenotype um, data models. Um, the the uh, Myappy group comes to mind, um, but just, uh, you know, we've always worked very closely with the Myappy group. So Myappy and Brappy are totally intercompatible. Um, uh, done similar similar things with other standards groups, uh, MCPD, uh, um, uh, the, the GA4GH uh, genotype standards, you know, they're, they're, they're existing standards um, that I try to work with to not reinvent the wheel and just become compatible with to, to try and match what's already being done. Um, 
yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's probably other other reasons, but I'll I'll stop there in case there are other questions. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, we have a question in the chat from Brian Irish. He's asking, can you please describe how data from Grin Global moves to and from other applications via Brappy? So you used it as an example in your community slide, slide he believes, and um, this would be helpful to, to go into further depth to illustrate how this, this how Brappy works to move data around. Yeah, sure. So um, right now, I think uh, Grin Global has uh, uh, Brappy APIs implemented for retrieving um, uh, unsurprisingly, retrieving germplasm information and and some of the metadata around that germplasm information. So um, right now, I believe it's just a uh, sort of uh, pull and and search request, sort of data discoverability. Um, uh, so that's that's the the primary way they're they're using it right now is is being able to to pull that data uh, out of their system. Um, I have been in a few conversations uh, with with the the Grin Global group about uh, possibly um, building some sort of uh, standardization for germplasm ordering. Um, so being able to uh, order germplasm from a gene bank uh, and um, then then you know move the the relative uh, the, the relevant metadata back and forth depending on uh, the order and and what's what's available. Um, so yeah, so right now it's just being able to retrieve um, information from a from a gene bank via an API. Um, but yeah, looking looking forward to working with them more and, and expanding that functionality. Great. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat or anybody raising their hands, so I can ask another question. I have a couple. Um, so uh, further, so moving on with the adoption question that I had earlier, um, you mentioned the hackathons. So I was wondering, Two things. One, were those, do you think those actually help recruit new groups to using Brappy? And two, have you noticed, um, are, are there any particular barriers uh, for new groups to adopt Brappy? Like as, as since, since Brappy is not software, right? You mentioned that. So if my database, which I've decided to, to um, use breeding data to, st to store breeding data and share it, um, it would take my developer team time to to implement the the API, uh, the web services software component to to use that standard and share it. So, uh, have you noticed like specific problems that uh, that databases or new tools have run into to to get over that that hurdle? And have the hackathons helped? I mean, I'm thinking sort of like from our data data federation survey, sort of what the barriers to adoption of a particular you know, programmatic accesses access to to data has been, and then the, the levels of inertia that prevent people from from adopting it. So I'm sort of digging into that question a bit more here with with the Brappy example. Yeah. So um, I'll start I'll start with your first question. So the hackathons um, definitely do help with uh, uh, recruitment to uh, sort of new people and and sometimes new groups. Um, the I I I want to say about about one third of the participants for every in person hackathon we've had um, are new to the Brappy community. Um, some of those are are new organizations. Some of those are just new people coming from existing organizations. But about a third of of each hackathon has has been new people. So that. And that that's held consistent up to the the last the latest one we just we just had um, in South Carolina. So uh, yeah, so that's that's definitely a piece of it. Um, uh, in terms of yeah, the the barriers, um, I you know I I do my best to try and keep the barriers to entry as low as possible um, when uh, developing. Um, uh, you know, new groups trying to develop their their Brappy implementation. 
Um, I, you know, from, from, uh, I, I try to tell everyone uh, from a personal perspective, I, uh, this is my whole job. I am here to support, uh, you guys and, and the developers building things. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to consult and, and help figure out, you know, the best way of doing things. Um, uh, there are, uh, several, several resources on Brappy.org, um, and, you know, sort of pre-built libraries that have a lot of the, um, sort of time consuming stuff that you need to, to build, uh, uh an API, uh, a pre-built in a few different languages, um, in a few different programming languages, I mean, um, uh, and uh, on uh, one of the one of the sites where we host uh, the the Brappy documentation is called Swagger Hub, um, and Swagger Hub actually has a tool uh, built into it for auto generating code based on, on the the API definition. Um, it's not perfect because it's you know it's trying to auto auto generate and build code on the fly, but it's good enough that a lot of people you know if if we don't have a community library. Um, for people to use in, in a particular language that usually covers enough to give some sort of a head start. Um, that said, one of the sort of biggest hurdles that every group has to deal with is that mapping piece of mapping their internal data structures to the, the Brappy data structures. Um, and that's, that's a lot of the time where, where I am called in to help. Um, and and do that consulting of trying to figure out okay this is this is the use case we're trying to solve this is how we represent it internally what does that look like in Brappy um, and that conceptual step is often the hardest but it only has to happen once once you get through that um, then the the code to actually implement an API is is pretty straightforward, especially if you're using a you know pre-generated library. Um, so yeah, there is some work involved, and and I try to support uh, new groups and and lower that barrier as much as I I can. Thanks. All right, Lenore has a question in the chat. Um, is the mapping manual or do you use software to help map? That's a good question. Um, so the the conceptual the conceptual mapping is often manual. You have to sort of figure out, okay, I, you know, uh, in in my database over here, I have this thing called an experiment. In Brappy, that's represented as a thing called a study. And an experiment has a field, uh, you know, called start. And in Brappy, that's called start date. So there, there is, you know, that has to happen, you know, at, at manually at some level for no other reason than just to understand it as, as humans, you know, you have to be able to figure that out. Um, once you've figured that out and figured out, sort of drawn the lines of what each piece means, then you turn that into software. Um, and so, you know, that once you've, you've done that process, you turn that mapping into software and any request from then on just goes through the same, you know, the same automatic mapping, uh, Uh, so some of it is semantic, but I wonder if the basic representations are all different. Uh, Lenore, can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Sorry, can you hear me? I have yep. microphone problem. <laughs> um, so I, I find this really interesting, right? Because you're sort of getting an opportunity to compare sort of data structures, you know, different represent different representations of the same concept in different places. And I'm some of what you describe is like, you know, a start versus start date is just like you it's it's the definition is the same thing, right? So of of the field. And what I wonder about is like if the how variable the definitions of those entities are themselves. In other words, is there the the components of an experiment vastly different than the components of a study 
In other words, are you are we coming to some universal agreement over what are the fundamental, you know, types of data that should be considered to be part of a study or an experiment or whatever? Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, that that definitely makes sense. So yeah, I think um, uh, it, you know, as you said, in a lot of in a lot of cases, there are some, you know, a lot of basic things that every uh, study or experiment has to have. Um, and we are coming to some consensus uh, about those things, especially within the community, you know, as as we see the standard progress, uh, you know, uh, four or five years ago, the the concept of a study in BRAPI has changed a lot uh, since, since then. Um, but in the past year, a couple of years, you know, the past few versions of the standard, the study is sort of solidifying into, you know, no, nobody's asking for new fields to be added to that um, recently. Um, but, you know, each, uh, each database is different and, and has different purposes and has different um, aspects that they care about. So um, one of the things we made sure to, to include in BRAPI is, Every single BRAPI object has a section called additional information. And that is freeform, <clears throat> excuse me, freeform to put whatever data or metadata you want in that. Um, and it will still, you know, it'll it's part of the spec. It'll come back in every every response, but that's an opportunity to put in things that are sort of custom to your system and and um, important. To, to you and, and some of the things you're doing may be important to some of the people who connect to you, but, uh, you know, not standardized across the whole community. Um, and so that's, that's sort of how we tried to, to approach that problem is, you know, having the basic set of things that everyone agrees is part of, uh, a, a, a data representation and then allow people to add extra stuff as needed um, to their own implementation. Okay. I got got a thumbs up. Cool. Okay. Any more hands up or questions? I have another question. Sorry. <laughs> Fire. Okay. Um, all right. I, I do have one more question. Um, and I'll try to make it short. So uh, one of the things that's come up in AgBio data uh, in terms of you know niches or, or gaps that we might need to work on is representing phenotypic data and uh, what, what challenges still exist with that. Um, and so I wanted to ask you uh, how one might use BRAPI for that with a particular use case, a very hypothetical one. So say I run the I5K workspace at the National Agri Agricultural Library, we deal with insect data and we don't deal with breeding data, but say hypothetically, we wanted to, to, to add that in, and I can imagine, you know, mealworms, people are starting to breed, you know, some certain beetles for, for um, entomophagy, for eating them and for protein content for animal feed. And so they're probably interested in a, a phenotype of, of protein content. And we'd probably have ontologies to represent that specifically for insects. So could I use BRAPI? Like, uh, to, could I map insect phenotypic data to BRAPI? Uh, like, if, if there are terms that are very particular to an insect, um, you know, like, I don't know, appendage length or something that a plant really wouldn't have. <laughs> like, what would it take for, for, for an insect database to, to use BRAPI for phenotypic data? Um, is that even possible? Um, so... Um... Yes is the the first the the most basic answer to your question is yes <laughs> with with a with a star with an asterisk. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in terms of sort of pure phenotypes, you know, and and observations, um, the way Brappy handles that is uh, sort of very uh, uh, broad in terms of um, you've got the the observation unit which is the the thing that you're representing the observation variable which is the, the variables a combination of trait method scale um, so you can fully describe whatever that is and attach 
you know that that's all attached to the ontology and you know has links back to to whatever ontology and then you've got the observation which is a combination of the the unit the thing you're looking at the variable um you know what the the the, the concept you're looking at and the value the observation value so um that basic structure should be able to cover any you know types of uh phenotypic observations you're um, looking at connected to whatever ontology you're looking at so yes that's the basic answer um that said uh because brappy was primarily sort of built with with plant breeding in mind the metadata that's part of that observation unit um is gonna be a little bit you know, biased towards plants. Um, so um, there are some, uh, uh, you know, there's there's some assumptions that the observation unit is going to just exist at a single place with a single set of GPS coordinates. Um, there's uh, some assumption, you know, there there are some keyword um, uh, lists that sort of involve. Uh, uh, plots and uh, subplots and and plants and that sort of things. Um, I know. Um, I think I think I saw uh, Moira on here a second ago, but um, the the breeding insight group um, here at Cornell um, has tried to implement it with um, fish. So they they I think they've had some success using Brappy with their uh, with their salmon database. Um, so it, it can be done. There's just a, a couple of things that need to be fudged a little bit to, you know, account for some of the bias towards plants. Um, but yes. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that explains it. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, it looks like we're at the top of the hour. So, and I don't see any more hands or questions. So let's thank Peter again for an excellent presentation and some, some thought provoking stuff. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you for coming. Yep. Thank you guys. Yep.